Good morning, everyone. We are in Hebrew still. There's 13 chapters in Hebrew. So we're getting near the end. I know it kind of feels like, is this book ever going to end? It's really not that long. Uh, it's just that there's a lot there. Although I have to admit, I was thinking this when I was working through this lesson this week. Um, the author of Hebrews seems to be stuck a little bit on his theme. It's not a bad place to be stuck, but he has really been hammering this idea of Jesus' sacrifice in comparison to the old sacrificial system. And, and we're going to look at that again today in the, the verses we're going to look at in chapter 10. Um, but in a, And I thought, hasn't he already made this point a couple of times? I mean, we, I, I know I've mentioned that at least the last two Sundays, if not the, the three previous Sundays. And I've, I've come to the conclusion it's a really important point that he's trying to, the author is trying to communicate with his Jewish congregation. You can't drift back into Judaism. You can't do that. Um, he doesn't want them to do that. God doesn't want them to do that. Uh, he and God want them moving forward. And so he seems to really be driving this point home in, in uh, revisiting the concept um, of Jesus' sacrifice. And the fact that the old sacrificial system just can't compare to what Christ has done. So it seems as though he's really, really driving home those two points. The old covenant has come and gone. It served its purpose. It wasn't bad, but it was limited in its impact. The new covenant is here. And it's the only one that we can embrace. We can't go back to the old covenant. So I, I think that's why he's, he's still continuing to hammer this point now. Things are going to shift a bit whenever we get into the rest of chapter 10 and then um, definitely into chapters 11 and 12. He's still going to be driving home uh, that basic theme of the new covenant and the old covenant in different ways. So if you're, if you're sitting there as we're reading the passage thinking, have we already talked about sacrifice before? Yes, and we're going to talk about it again today. And he's, he's going to deal with that as well once more. So Hebrews chapter 10, we're going to look at, look at verses 5 through 18. Which means uh, we're going to at least finish chapter 10 next week, maybe getting into uh, uh, chapter 11, but I don't think so. Chapter 11 is a completely different thing. So Hebrews chapter 10, verses 5 through 18. And could somebody read verses 5 through 7? Therefore, when he had come into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin you had no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do your will, O God. So we have a nice long quote here. Uh, well, not that long, it's, but it's from Psalm 40, verses 6 and 7. Once again, uh, using what we would call the Old Testament, what he would call the Scripture, to drive home another point. And... Um, in the quote that he uses, it, it states that uh, God doesn't desire sacrifice. So according to the, the quote that he gives us, if God doesn't desire sacrifices, what does God desire? A body you have prepared for me. A body you have prepared for me. For you to accept um, them as the supreme sacrifice. What you do to accept uh, Jesus as the supreme sacrifice and to do your will, to do your will, O oh God. Um, that's the, the main point he seems to be driving home. There's a, a compare and contrast he's doing here. Uh, the, there are four terms actually used in this very brief quote for sacrifices sacrifice and offering, and then whole burnt offering, sacrifices for sin or sin offerings. He seems to be covering the full gamut in the Old Covenant. There is no form of sacrifice that can compare to what God ultimately desires, and that is that not just us, but that Jesus should do uh, the will of his Father. Uh, that's the main point that he's driving home. This is not new. Obviously, it's not new because this is coming from the Old Testament. This is a, a quote from Psalm. You probably think of other passages, one that came to my mind uh, 
that probably came to yours is 1 Samuel 15, 22. Does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the Lord? To obey is better than sacrifice, to heed is better than the fat of rams. This is not a new concept that ultimately God doesn't want sacrifices. Now that begs the question, why did God implement that system of, of uh, animal sacrifices? And, and that's not really the main thrust of what's going on here. Uh, the point is kind of like, well, if the earthly sanctuary was not the main point, why have it? Because it was intended to drive home a, a, the idea that it's intended to direct us towards something greater, something bigger, something better. Um, so what does it ultimately mean that God desires doing his will? What does that mean? I, I mean, that we know what it means, but what does it mean? If that's what God really desires, that we do his will, what does that entail for us? What is he communicating in this quote? To do his will. And what does that mean? I mean, it's it's very easy for me to stand here and say, well, the scriptures say we're supposed to do God's will. Any questions? Amen. Let's go. What does that mean? Study the scriptures to we, find out. We need to study the scriptures to find out what that means, and we also need to study the scriptures. Not just to find out what that means, to find out a lot of things. What else does it mean to do God's will? Listen to the Holy Spirit. Listen to the leading of the Holy Spirit. However, we are so led and guided by Him in whatever way, shape, or form. What else does it mean to do His will? I'm not going for anything specific here, by the way. It means to not do our own will. It means we don't do what we want to do. Unless what we want to do is what he wants us to do. That's an important point. That's a really important point. Uh, I'm glad you brought that up, Jeff. That's a very important point. It means there's only one will that we can follow, and it can't be ours. Even, I'm speaking from personal experience, even when we know better than God, or parenthetically, when we think we know better than God, there's been more than one time in my life when I've had a perfect plan, and I've communicated that to God, and He must be on board with it because it's just perfect for me, and it never works. It just falls apart because ultimately I'm doing what, what I want to do. And it's not necessarily something bad. I'm not talking about I abandon my faith and I go live a, a life outside of Christianity or anything along those lines, but... I start moving along a path that I think this is perfect, and it's not. What else might it mean to do His will? To be as Christ-like as possible. To follow uh, an example. It's a template. Yeah, exactly. That's that's a concept that the author of Hebrews has uh, given to us as well. There's somebody we're supposed to follow. There's an example. It, it, it's it is the things that we've talked about. We don't do our will. We, we uh, read and study the scriptures to find out what that means, but if you want a very practical example of what it means to do the Father's will, look to the Son who did the Father's will. Um, that's an excellent point as well. Uh, we have a pattern to follow. It's not a matter of figure it out on your own. We don't have to figure it out. The, at, at the bottom of all of these concepts is that idea of relationship. Doing God's will is not demonstrating obedience. Now, obedience is a part of it, obviously. If you're going to do the Father's will, you're obedient to that will. I, I get that. But this is not like Islam, where it's about simple, pure obedience. Do whatever God tells you to do. At the bottom and the essence of this is a relationship, a living, dynamic relationship with the living God. That's what he's really ultimately going for. And so when we do his will, it's not just simply conforming uh, to commands, although there are commands that are part of it. It's because, in essence, he wants us to draw close to him. He wants us to know him. He wants us to understand him. He wants us to be in a, a living relationship with him. And that's not in the sense of some sort of touchy-feely type of thing that's a counterpoint to the deep theological doctrinal issues that we deal with in this very uh, dense book of Hebrews. That's what God is ultimately going for. He is going not ultimately for obedience. He's going for us to be in a relationship with us because he loves us. 
if love weren't at the basis of all of this, then we could just simply conform or obey and he'd be happy with that. That's a pagan concept where we just simply uh, follow after commands and rules. You know, the Bible is not a rule book, never has been, never will be. So Psalm 40, that quote, uh, verses 6 through 7, uh, it is a, it's a biblical statement of the sacrifice that could not take away sins. And even though uh, in, this is a Davidic psalm, and even though David is speaking, um, he, the, the author of Hebrews is couching it in language in which Jesus is speaking. He gives these words to Jesus. Um, it, it's not just simply David quoting, it's David's messianic descendant who is quoting or speaking these words. Uh, that's why when it says, but a, but a body you have prepared for me, that's an intentional usage of that passage from Psalm because it's a reference to the Incarnation. Uh, that the Father has given the Son a body by which a sacrifice could be performed which is superior to animal sacrifices. And in, in, the, in the bottom of this is the idea of comparing the sacrifice of Jesus, a willing sacrifice, with the um, unwilling, I guess for lack of a better term, the unwilling animal sacrifices. There's probably never been an instance during the sacrificial system in which uh, a sheep raised his or her hand and said, well, I'm willing to be sacrificed. They were dumb animals that were dumb in the sense that they cannot speak and they, they don't volunteer their opinion in this. They were taken and sacrificed. Jesus doesn't unwillingly or unknowingly walk into his sacrifice. He does so willingly and knowing exactly the full impact of what it means for his relationship with the Father, his relationship with us, and the restoration of that relationship between us and the Father. He knows what he's doing. He knows what he's getting into. Um, and I, I think I've come across this passage before, but one of the commentaries noted that there's sort of an echo in this in Peter's sermon in Acts chapter 2, Acts 2, 29 through 31, where he says, Fellow Israelites, I tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried, and his tomb is here to this day. But he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was to come, he spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, that he was not abandoned to the realm of the dead, nor did his body see decay. Um, and, and I'm wondering if that's sort of echoing in the usage of this psalm passage. David died, but his messianic descendant didn't die. Not only did he not die, he, well, he, he did not die and was buried and remains buried. He died and was raised from the dead. His body actually died. That's why there, there's that usage of body there. And so he's drawing a comparing and contrast the way that Peter was in his sermon uh, in Jerusalem in Acts chapter 2. In, in that phrase, where am I at? Um, you have fashioned a body for me, as I mentioned before. That's probably a reference to the incarnation. And that's part of the reason why he gives those words to Jesus. And there's a, a, another interesting phrase in there. Mine, it's in verse 7, it's in parentheses. In the role of the book, it is written, for, uh, written of me, and I, I think Scott's translation had, in the volume of the book. Does somebody have something other than role or volume? In the scroll. In the scroll. Most translations are scroll. Um, that could be the law, the Torah, uh, or it could be all of Scripture, or it, it could be, if you remember back in the first, I'm sure you all do, chapter 1, verse 1, God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and in many ways, in other words, it's all of Scripture, how uh, God had been communicating, Jesus is coming. My Messiah is coming. I've got a plan all laid out. This is not new. You've heard of this before. And here he is. And here it is. And here the new covenant is. And uh, he's highlighting that fact again when, and it's, when he quotes in verse 7, Behold, I have come to do your will. In the role of the book it is written of me. In other words, you people already know this. He's, he's saying to his congregation, not you people, we know this as, as believers, as Christians today, we know this. But he's telling his Jewish congregation, this is not new. You've read of Jesus coming before, repeatedly. Um, 
there are instances in the Old Testament, we don't get the details always, like when Jesus is um, speaking to his two disciples after his resurrection and says he goes through the scriptures and he talks about the, you know, the law and the prophets uh, where it demonstrates uh, his coming and uh, his resurrection and all that. It would be great to know all the details and, and uh, get all the passages, but this is nothing new. This has been the plan all along. Yes? Can you straighten out the pronouns for me? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> so in verse 7, he's referencing Psalm 40, which is the Psalm of David. Uh -huh. So, then David said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God. Mm -hmm. And parenthetically, it says, In the scroll of the book, it is written of me. That me is God, right? Yeah, Jesus specifically. Jesus. Uh -huh. Okay. I didn't go back to look at first at Psalm forty, but where's that coming from? In the scroll it is written of me. Um, it just doesn't make sense to me. It it doesn't uh, with just pure reading, but I think that there's two responses. The first one is the opening line in verse 5, which is not a quote. Therefore, when he, that is Jesus, comes into the world, Jesus says, he says, not David. So the author of Hebrews is giving these words to Jesus. Okay. Um, and um, this cannot be David speaking because, but a body you have prepared for me cannot be a reference to David being prepared for the sacrifice. So David is speaking these words in song, but not necessarily of himself, because David himself gave sacrifices, but was not a sacrifice. So I think the author of Hebrews, were he here, he would say, these words are Jesus' words. They must be. Um, and, and I think he would also say, whether you believe that or not, I'm telling you that at the opening of verse 5 that are my words. When he came to the world, he says this stuff. Uh, and we see that more than once. It's kind of like um, in Matthew, whenever he quotes the passage about uh, a Savior will be born of a virgin. It's not what the, the, the Greek word is virgin, but the Hebrew word is young woman. So the uh, and, and it's not manipulating the text. It's understanding the text in the light of Christ. Uh, Jesus is, as one of my uh, theology professors would say, Jesus is the epistemological window by which we look upon the scriptures. In other words, and I think the author of Hebrews would agree with this, now that Jesus has come, well, I don't have an Old Testament with me, he would raise up his scrolls, uh, the law, the prophets, and the writings. He would say, we can't look at this the way that we did before. We've got Jesus now. And Jesus exposes the scriptures in a way that provides us with not a better or a different, but a clearer understanding. So that when somebody in 200 BC reads this, they would understand it's probably a messianic figure, but I don't know who that is. I don't know what that really means. The author of Hebrews comes along and says, well, I know exactly what that means. It means Jesus. These are his words. He's speaking to us. Uh, through the scriptures. So does that make sense? Yeah, and the author of Hebrews would know at least more clearly that this coming Messiah that the other guy knew about gave his body, that he gave his body, mm -hmm. which the other guy wouldn't. Yeah, the guy in 200 BC or David wouldn't necessarily understand that because human sacrifice was anathema in Judaism. You don't sacrifice human beings. And so what could this mean? Well, once again, as uh, Dr. Poole would say, you pull out your epistemological window. That's, that's the window through which you look in order to know and understand. That's who Jesus is. Now, looking through the lens, I guess that's an easier way of understanding it, is Jesus is the lens by which we see clearly the scriptures. You look through the lens of Jesus, and this makes perfect sense. We know what that means. He gave his body. And I think the author of Hebrews is um, emphasizing that point, but a body you have prepared for me. The Father gave the Son a body, a real human body, and that real human body was really nailed to a cross, and that real human body really died 
and was really buried and was really transformed and really resurrected. It really, really happened. And it had to happen that way. That was necessary. Uh, that there was the incarnation, the crucifixion, and the resurrection. You've got to take the whole shebang. Hope that's not too scholarly of a term for you. I'm not speaking over anybody saying that. <laughs> but that comes from the Greek uh, shebangos, shebang, shebang. Anyway. <laughs> I, now I digress. See what you people do to make your Bible. <laughs> anyway, could somebody read verses 8 and 9 and save me, please? After saying above, sacrifices and offerings, and whole burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin you have not desired, nor have you taken pleasure in them, which are offered according to the law. Then he said, Behold, I have come to do your will. He takes away the first in order to establish the second. So the author of Hebrews interprets this Old Testament passage, once again, using Jesus as the lens of the epistemological window. What he uh, declares to us, in case you're wondering, he makes it very clear at the end of verse 9. All of this means is that Jesus canceled the debt of sin. It's been done away with. It's been taken away. The guilt is gone. The sin is gone. It can't be used against you any longer. And the old has been replaced with the new, period, paragraph, end of story. You can't go any further than that. I mean, you can because there's other things that take place in Scripture, and, um, in, in the life of the church and all of that stuff. But in regard to the comparison between the old sacrifice and the new sacrifice, the new has replaced the old, and that's it. And it's a way, once again, of saying, therefore, Jewish congregation, you cannot drift back can't drift back. You can't go back. Um, so the former sacrificial system was performed according to the law, as it should have been, as God intended, and the new order has occurred as a result of Jesus' absolute obedience to and embrace the Father's will. And so that quote, at least in verse 9, the, the quote that he gives there, Behold, I have come to do your will. This exemplify, exemplifies who and what Jesus was and is. So who is this Jesus? He's the one who came to do the Father's will. And all that occurred as a result of that, the incarnation, his ministry, his teachings, his being a perfect sacrifice, not giving in to temptation, being that, uh, as Kermit said, that template for us to follow and understanding what it means to follow uh, the Father's will, to be obedient to the Father. All of that is an exemplification of who and what Jesus is. Could somebody read verse 10? By that, uh, by that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. Why would the author state that phrase, offering of the body, here? He didn't have to say that. He, he's been talking a lot about Jesus' sacrifice. This is not the first time we've heard about that. Sacrifice has come up a lot. But all of a sudden, he throws out, sanctified through the offering of Jesus Christ? No, of the body of Jesus Christ. Because they would offer the body of animals. They would offer uh, the, the bodies uh, of animals. And he's drawing a contrast there. A body has been offered, but it's not a body of animals. Why else might he, you know, not necessarily going for any sign? I think he's tying it back to Psalm 40, where the word body is used. He's definitely drawing a direct correlation between those two. That comes out in some passage, and he uses that word again intentionally. Anything else about using the offering of the body? kind of gets back to what we've already uh, mentioned. It's the incarnation. This is a, a, a real human being who is also God who really gave his body. And this is the first time in reference to the humanity of Jesus that the author of Hebrews uses the word body, somatos in Greek. Before this, he had made reference to uh, Jesus as a human being, but he used the word flesh, sarx. 
used it twice uh, in a couple of passages, but now all of a sudden, instead of using the word that he's used before, he intentionally uses the word soma, body, the real body of Jesus Christ to give expression to his full humanity, to emphasize it is a bodily sacrifice, but it's not the type of bodies that have been sacrificed in the past. It's different. It's not an animal sacrifice. It's the sacrifice of the Son of God. Um, and so to fulfill the Father's will, Jesus' incarnate body was made an offering. So the incarnation occurs to result in the offering of Jesus. Got to have the incarnation. Otherwise, we don't have the bodily sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Uh, he's, he's driving home that point that Jesus yielded himself fully and wholly, completely and totally. Gave himself over as a sacrifice. All in who and what he does. He doesn't just come and give us new teaching. He is the new teaching and he demonstrates that in his obedience to the Father by willingly allowing himself to be persecuted and whipped and nailed to a cross and actually dying and being buried and then the Father raising him from the dead. And that reality will be our reality. We will be resurrected from the dead. I know that's not a new concept to us. I know that. I, I, you know, I get that. But he's also emphasizing a concept that he's mentioned before. Since the bodily offering of Jesus Christ was once for all, we're done with sacrifices. It's not new to us, but it was new to them, was it not? It was very new to them. Because once again, in Judaism, human bodies are not sacrificed. So this is a really problematic concept. Animal sacrifices, we've done that for centuries. No big deal. But you're telling us that this man, who's also God, sacrificed his body on our behalf. That's alien. It's alien to them, but not the overall concept of sacrifice. Um, interestingly enough, it wouldn't have been as alien a concept among Gentiles as it would have been among Jews. Human sacrifice? Now, the Romans didn't accept human sacrifice, but other Gentile pagan uh, practices might incorporate human sacrifice. Usually infants, children, uh, you know, in order to bless your crops, you give your uh, firstborn child over to the local god and, and sacrifice your firstborn child to the god uh, so that uh, your crops will uh, be bountiful, etc., etc. So it's interesting that this is the exact opposite of what a Jewish congregation would want to hear. A human body sacrifice is, is heresy. But what he's emphasizing is that not only is it not heresy, it's necessary. It's got to be done, and it's got to be done this way. And parenthetically, if you have a problem with it, take it up with God, which means peruse through the scriptures. Because if you have a problem with it, you've got a problem with this passage that he just quoted. You've given me a body to be a sacrifice, and I sacrifice that body on behalf of my people. They have to accept this. Um, I'm not as familiar with this uh, in, in first century Judaism and uh, the, the clash between uh, Pharisees and the Sadducees and the teachings of Jesus and his apostles, but it, it makes me wonder if this was part of the problem of why Jews would not accept the Christian message, not just in the first century, but in the second and third century, because Christians are advocating the idea that uh, it's a, really a double heresy. Not only is it a human sacrifice, he is telling, the author of Hebrews is telling his Jewish congregation, God died. God doesn't die. Uh, we don't have what's known as docetism or some sort of uh, monarchianism, dynamic monarchianism, something like that, where right before the, the man Jesus dies, the spirit of God is removed so that God doesn't die, but the, the human Jesus dies. We don't, that, that's not in the scriptures. You can't split that up. One of the hard concepts, I think, for us that I don't really hear that much in Christendom anymore is the fact that God died. Jesus is God. Jesus died. God died. You know, a lot of people don't even realize that Jesus was God. Mm -hmm. They haven't been told. And, but the more you read the Old Testament, everything speaks to that. Mm -hmm. Jesus, Jesus is the entire story of the Old Testament. But the burden has been gotten got rid of. It's like Jesus was sacrificed. Now you had, no longer had to take 
you know, the hassle of getting the perfect animal, it takes a lot of stress off the believer, uh, the particular Jewish person, to uh, know that now they can be free of that, which gives them more of a chance to, you know, let Christ who's resurrected, who's real, come into their lives, and it's totally taken everything away. Mm -hmm. If you can embrace it, if you can wrap your mind around it, yeah. Um, and that's that's part of this point. We're done with the old sacrificial system. It's come and it's gone because we've had the ultimate sacrifice. Well, in the case of Christ and, and the people as well, death is the death of the body, but the, the spirit lives on. Mm -hmm. And so it's the death of Christ's body, but his spirit lives on. So... That way, I see God's not dead oblivion, but dies as similar as, as, as we would die. The body dies. I don't know. I can't explain that one. Uh, that's kind of like if you want me to explain the Trinity, I, the answer is I, don't, I can't explain the Trinity. I don't. I don't have a good explanation for that. I don't think there is a good explanation for it. Um, how exactly Jesus died, and I think because we're not supposed to get really too wound up about it. What are the mechanics and the, the doctrinal aspects of all of this? Uh, I don't know. That Jesus died is the concept that comes through very clearly. Um, and how all that played out, it's kind of like when people ask, well, what was Jesus doing in the tomb uh, when, when he was dead? Well, he was dead. Uh, and, and I've heard people say, well, but he, uh, his spirit went to the, the Father after his... I don't know. I don't know. So you may be right. I just don't know. That's a hard one. You often ask hard questions, Jess. <laughs> or make hard, difficult statements. Another one. Yes. <laughs> well, like most of the animal sacrifices, the important part seems to be the blood. Mm -hmm. the whole, or the ones where they burn up the whole carcass, but... Jesus doesn't seem to be in the son of one as much as the body. Uh, well, uh, you can't really separate the two because the blood represents life uh, the, in, in Judaism. That's the point of a blood sacrifice. It's a life for a life in exchange for a life. Um, there is an... I, I think you're right. You know, the concept of blood does come out in the New Testament, but the concept of body does more. Because that's a harder thing to embrace with the incarnation and the resurrection. Those two aspects of who Jesus was and is in the first century just doesn't click, doesn't make sense. And so I've, I've noticed this as well. There seems to be a real hammering home. You see this in the Gospels too. Uh, like when we looked at some, uh, we looked at three of the different resurrection stories last year. Uh, from the three of the Gospels, there seems to be this heavy-handed emphasis on the body of Jesus, as if the authors wanted their readers to know Jesus' body had a real body, and it really died, and it really suffered. That, that, that's part of the reality of who Jesus is. Well, it was a real incarnation. After the resurrection, the evidence is not seeing blood. It's seeing the body. It's, yeah, it's seeing the body. And that comes out repeatedly. Um, that, that concept of he has really been raised from the dead. He has been changed and transformed. If, if you remember when we were looking at those, those lessons about the resurrection uh, three, from three of the Gospels, um, there was a lot of folk not recognizing him when they first saw him. And you remember that? You know, you know, you probably are familiar enough with the resurrection stories to know that it, it, when somebody sees Jesus raised after he's raised from the dead, the first thing they don't say is, it's Jesus, he's back. It's kind of like, uh, what's the gardener doing here telling me that why, why are you looking for the living among the dead? Uh, or, or, you know, Mary Magdalene doesn't recognize uh, who Jesus is. Nobody recognizes who Jesus the, the two disciples in Luke, they don't recognize who Jesus is until he reveals everything, and then he disappears, and then suddenly hits them. Man, that was Jesus. He was right here. Um, emphasizing, once again, a resurrected body is a real body, but it's a different body. It's a transformed body. It's a transition body. It's not the same that it was before, which emphasizes, once again, 
It's not the same thing that Lazarus went through. Um, Carla listens to KLTY in the mornings very loudly. She's taking a shower. She has it really cranked up. So I'm in the other end of the and, well, you know, it's in order to hear it over the shower. Uh, I did need to, that, that's my burden. Uh, anyway, and, I, and they play the same songs over and over. There's one about, uh, I want to rise up like Lazarus. Well, I don't. I want to rise up like Jesus because Lazarus died again. Jesus raised him from the dead, but that was a resuscitation. That was not a resurrection. Those are two different things. I always want, and I've even asked uh, Carl that, why do you think he wrote that? Why, why do you think this uh, contemporary Christian author wrote about wanting to be raised up like Lazarus? That's not the point. We want to be raised up like Jesus, changed, changed and transformed. Our bodies, um, if you read 1 Corinthians 13, God's not done with your body. It will not be abandoned. It will not be left behind. It will be changed and transformed. It's a, our resurrection will be a bodily resurrection. And please don't ask me about, well, what if you are, uh, you know, you're buried at sea or your body is blown apart in war or, uh, you know, something like, I don't know. Uh, you know, God's going to work all that stuff out. But the point is this, it's a bodily resurrection because that's what Jesus had, a bodily resurrection. Um, and uh, I think Jeff's right. It, it comes out more. The body comes out more than the blood. Well, in the Old Testament, the... Uh you could have human sacrifice or animal sacrifice, and they both have bodies. Mm -hmm. What distinguishes them is blood. Mm -hmm. And so maybe that's why blood is emphasized in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think also that uh, their understanding that a life is give, being given for a life. Life is pouring out, blood is pouring out. I mean, loss of blood is, for lack of a better term, cinematically, that's how we see. Yeah, I mean, when you lose enough blood. Mm -hmm. it, it, it is definitely a visual expression of, of the, the sacrificial system that's being taken place. But Jesus' body is an emphasis not just on the, uh, the crucifixion, but it's a greater emphasis on the resurrection. That's the cinematic experience that we now have. That's the visual that we get, is the fact that Jesus has been raised from the dead bodily raised from the dead, real resurrection. No questions asked. That's a hard concept in the first century. Guess what? That's a hard concept in the 21st century. Bodily resurrections. I, I know that we've been throwing that concept around for the last 2,000 years, but it's still very alien to the way people think. To die and be done with it, that, that's something that people can wrap their minds around. You know, what this is all that, you know, like uh, Carl Sagan said, the cosmos is all there ever was, all that there is, all that there will ever be. Your body is what you have, and that's all you get. And when it's gone, it's gone. And Jesus comes along and says, no, I'm not done with you. I've got bigger and better things for you. And it's an odd thing, but it's necessary that it be a bodily resurrection. So there is a new heaven and a new earth that we're entering into. We will not be spirits floating around in heaven like a scene from a black and white movie where everybody's floating around on piano wire dressed like angels. That's not what it is. It, it is a, a new life in Christ. And it's we're, we have a foretaste of that now. We are preparing for that life in the future. Ultimately, doesn't, isn't the Holy Trinity born out of the sacrifice? How so? Well, in the resurrection, that's Jesus' transition to back to God the Father. Oh, you mean the way that he enters into that, really? Oh, yeah, that, that's definitely there. Um, his resurrection then allows him to have that access into the heavenly out, sanctuary. Out of sacrifice. Mm -hmm. Life. Yeah, exactly. Um, so the, that concept of, uh, getting back a little bit, that concept of obedience is not just something that we exemplify, our obedience to the Father. Jesus' sacrifice uh, demonstrates his obedience to the Father. And as a result of that, 
he enters into the Father's presence, which I know he was there before, but he enters into the Father's presence now with a resurrected body, uh, restoring a relationship that is going to restore our relationship with the Father, which is what God wanted all along until sin entered into the picture in Genesis chapter 3. So it's, in one sense, it's not a new relationship that we will have with the Father. It will be a restoration of the relationship that the Father always intended to have with us. And that's achieved through the restoration of the relationship that the Son and the Father have with each other as a result of his obedience to the Father's will. Can somebody read verses 11 and 12? Out loud. Every priest stands day after day ministering and offering the same sacrifices time after time, which can never take away sin. But this man, after offering one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. There's a little phrase in here that's extremely important. In verse 12, he sat down at the right hand of God. And in that phrase, what's important is the first part, sat down. What is so important about Jesus offering one sacrifice and then sitting down? Those priests never sat down. Priests never sat down. What did they do after they performed their sacrifice? They left. They left. Jesus doesn't do that. Year after year, day after day, week after week, the priests perform their duties in the tabernacle and the temple. They go in and they do their, uh, their daily uh, duties that they perform, daily offerings. There was the annual offering of Yom Kippur that happened on the Day of Atonement. And uh, Aaron entered in, he performed the sacrifice, and he leaves. And then it's same, same time next year, comes back in, leaves, comes back in, leaves. Over and over and over and over again. Jesus enters in, performs his sacrifice, and sits down. And this is an important point because he's emphasizing the fact that our high priest doesn't leave the sanctuary because he's done performing sacrifices. We're done with sacrifices. That means we will not be sacrificed. Animals not, will not be sacrificed. There's no need for sacrifice. We've moved past that. Now, there are still priestly duties that uh, Jesus performs. He is interceding on our behalf before the Father. He's still in the heavenly sanctuary. Uh, when we lift up our voices in prayer, he hears them and he, uh, for lack of a better term, transmits them or communicates them to the Father. And they have a, a holy discourse in, in which the Son says, you heard my child, hear my, my sister, my brother, who's, this is his concern, this is her uh, pain and anguish and whatever it is, and, and the Father hears the Son more clearly, almost better. Uh, that's the priestly duties that are being performed. But as far as sacrifices are concerned, no more. Our high priest is seated, and seated in a, a very interesting position at the right hand of God. That is a position of empowerment. That's a, a position of enthronement, a position of victory. That is also um, a position of judgment. That's why it got Stephen in trouble back in Acts whenever he said, I see the Son sitting at the right hand of the power on high. He was telling the Jews around him, I see Jesus in the highest place that he could be seated in, a position of an enthroned in power, enthroned in authority and judgment over us. That's why they stoned him. It was bad up until that point, the things that he was preaching to them in his sermon to them, but when he told them, oh, by the way, the Jesus that I follow, he sits at the right hand of the Father. That was too much for them. But that's where Jesus is. He sits in judgment over us to a point. And that judgment is whether we've been washed in the blood of the Lamb. That judgment is not the guilt and the sin that we bring because that's been canceled out. It's been done away with. So it's a different type of priesthood that we experience. It can no longer be the priesthood of the temple. Could somebody read verses 13 to 14? Since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. Because by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. This is probably, especially in verse 14, it's a way of saying, uh, 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 
Where am I at here? I lost it. Uh, this, uh, not verse 14, verse 13. Until his enemies be made a footstool for his feet. He slips that Psalm 110 quote in probably as a way of telling his congregation, don't become one of Jesus' enemies. Join with him. Embrace uh, his obedience to the Father. Embrace him as sacrificed and high priest. Otherwise, the time will come when Jesus does have enemies and being made a footstool, that means he will be over them in judgment and in authority in a different way that he will be over uh, those who follow him. In other words, don't end up there. Uh, and so he is uh, emphasizing the, also this idea, almost in a logical progression, of this argument that applies and that Jesus' sacrifice alone has purified his people of their moral corruption. Uh, and all of this having been done permanently, uh, ultimately, as he says in verse 14, by offering, uh, for by offering he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified or those who are being sanctified or those who are being made holy. He uses that word perfected again. Um, and the, the, Greek, the Greek is actually having been sanctified. It's in the present passive participle, which probably doesn't mean anything to you, but the, the passive voice is important in the sense that we are being sanctified. It's being done to us. And also that it is a process that takes place. It's not, I accepted Christ when I was nine years old, I accepted Christ when I was 20 years old, and my, uh, that, that is the event uh, that uh, I'm referring to. It's the continued process of sanctification, of being made holy. It's preparation for that life that we will have uh, more directly when we enter into the heavenly sanctuary, uh, in the new heaven and the new earth. Uh, so the, the author of Hebrews is emphasizing three things so far in, in this passage, and really in the last couple of chapters as well, that there's this inner purging of people's conscience of their guilt, that we have been made acceptable to worship God directly, and also we are ex experiencing the ultimate fulfillment uh, that has been promised in the past. Uh, that this is all part of the process of being sanctified, uh, the process of sanctification uh, that, that he is communicating to his uh, congregation. That it's not just simply, I've been saved, I'll die, and I'll go to heaven. There's so much more to it than that. It's so much more than just dying and going to heaven. And it's not a process that takes place once we die. The process is taking place now. Those who are being uh, sanctified is in the present tense. So he's telling his congregation, you folks are being sanctified. He's telling us, we are being sanctified. So it's not just I was saved. It's also that I'm being sanctified. There's a process that's taking place in the midst of all of that. Could somebody read verses 15 through 18? The Holy Spirit also testifies to us about this. First he says, This is the covenant I will make with them after that time, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts. I will write them on their minds. Then he adds, Their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. And where these have been forgiven, there is no longer any sacrifices. So he brings out the Holy Spirit to let his congregation know this is God speaking. This is not the author's commentary. It's not his own spin, his own understanding. This is uh, the Holy Spirit speaking to them uh, clearly and once again quoting that uh, Jeremiah 31 passage that he actually had quoted earlier. Um, he, he is communicating to them that uh, Jesus' sacrifice was the last. It accomplished absolute forgiveness of sin and additional sin offering no longer necessary. We're done with that. The annual reminder of sin is done. The cancellation of sin is now here. That's the new covenant. Our sins, their sins, have been canceled out. The debt has been paid. The sins are removed. There is no, well, these sacrifices have been good for the last year. Now we have the next year of sin to look forward to in another Yom Kippur event, another Day of Atonement. We're done with that, which means we're done with the guilt, we're done with the impact of sin. Uh, that doesn't mean we can, and, and this comes out in other passages in the New Testament, we don't sin with impunity. We can do whatever we want because, well, God's going to forgive us. He has to. That's what Jesus died for. It's not a matter of that. It's a matter of the fact that 
uh, the, our sins have been canceled out and can no longer be used against us, we shouldn't use them against us. Satan should not be allowed to use them against us um, because God doesn't. There is no more, well, there's so much sin in my life that God would never accept me for who I am. No, he, he's canceled that sin. Uh, it's not something that uh, has an impact upon us any longer. There's no longer any sin offering, not because there's no longer any sin, but because there is now an inner purging of the conscience, a, a transformation from the inside out that's supposed to be taking place, and an ultimate doing away of sin. So we don't have to deal with it the way that it's been dealt with on a daily basis, a weekly basis, a monthly basis, an annual basis. Once for all, we're done with it. Um, and his, once again, his point that he's trying to emphasize to his congregation is he's not telling them you should not drift back or you must not drift back. He's telling them if this is all true, you can't drift back. You can't go into Judaism. Because those animal sacrifices do nothing now that Jesus is here. Now that we've had the ultimate sacrifice and we have the ultimate high priest, we don't have to go to the temple. We don't have to do Yom Kippur. We don't have the, uh, the uh, priest of the order of Aaron. We have the priest of the order of Melchizedek. This is a permanent priesthood and an ultimate impact of sacrifice. So I don't know if he would actually tell them this. Stop it. Stop drifting back into Judaism. It can't serve you. It will do nothing for you. It will not benefit you. Not because it's bad, not because it's evil, but because, uh, and, and it's not Judaism per se, it's that old sacrificial system. It's the old covenant that has been done away with, it's been removed. What should we, though, and you know, this is one of the questions I thought about. You know, sin's been canceled, it's done away with, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. but we still deal with sin. We still sin. I'm assuming that of you. I know it's true of me. So in the light of what we know, in the light of what the author of Hebrews has taught us about the cancellation of sin, how do we respond uh, in regard to the guilt of sin? How do we respond in regard to sins that we still commit? Um, do we just ignore it and move on? Or, or what do we do as we walk in Christ and sometimes falter in our walk, sometimes drift in our walk. I think we pray to God about it and let him know you're having a difficult time with it and pretty soon you just forget, you know, you just realize you're not doing it anymore. The Holy Spirit does what you can't do because you can't change a bad habit, but if you just give it to God, and sometimes I've just gotten busy doing things and I used to smoke and I one day didn't do it. You know. And um, I, uh, don't have the desire anymore. I think about it, but I don't have the desire anymore to do it. And uh, you just have to just give it to God. And his timing is totally different than yours. You know, that's how I have realized that I got myself straight. You know. Okay. The word forgiveness comes to mind. How so? We can always ask for it, and we should. Because part of the cancellation of sin is that we don't wallow in the, the sin and the guilt. Um, and I do believe that, that God wants us to speak to him about it and seek his forgiveness, knowing that it's available to us, knowing that we don't have to earn it. If we acknowledge that we made a mistake and we know we sin and we ask for forgiveness, it's, that's our opportunity to get right with God. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Again. Yeah, maybe not ultimately, but to, to get back on the path that he wants us back on. Well, for me, you know, it was 1980 was when my life had gotten completely out of control, and I just didn't think about it. And I just it was miserable, and I went to church after talking to someone at the Denton State School in the food service department. I just went home, and I said, I've got to go back to church. And not that church was the greatest thing that's going to happen to you, but it, it was like drawn, and I'm... 64 now and just over the past three years i've been i've become free of even thinking about it even desiring it so um, it's always there but i just don't do it my life's improved greatly mm -hmm. you know and uh, music has been the thing that's done it one of the things that's done it it's gotten me away from making pictures although i still want to do that but 
so that's a tool that God's used in confusing it. So it takes a long time, but um, pretty soon you're just a different person. Mm -hmm. you, know, you were before, and it's a great thing. It is true that our sins have been forgiven in the sense that they can't be used against us and they will not prevent us from entering into that heavenly sanctuary. But we also know that we still sin, but that forgiveness is available. It's part of the process of sanctification. That's part of the transformation. Um, that hopefully in our relationship with God, sin has less of an effect upon us, less of an impact, because we're growing closer to the Father and we're preparing more for that next life. We are preparing for the next life. We always need to keep that in mind. We're not holding in a pattern, waiting to die. We are alive in Christ. But the day will come when we will be even more alive in Christ. So the Christian life, as I've mentioned before, it's not just waiting to die and go to heaven, and then all is right with the world. It's that transformation that's supposed to take place, and it's about working on our relationship with God now, in ultimate preparation for eternity with him. The, our, our life now is linked with the next life, and not just in the sense of Jesus has died for us and we accept him as our Lord and Savior, and then we go through the motions of going uh, to church and being a good Christian. Um, that, that's, that's not the ultimate goal. Believe it or not, the ultimate goal is not going to heaven. The ultimate goal is a relationship with God, now and then. That's what he's wanted all along. That's why he sent his son. That's what the Christian life is. It's not about what we do. It's not about what we don't do. It's about who God is making us to be, um, about changing and transforming ourselves. He doing that to us, about the process of sanctification. So if we don't always get it right all the time, he knows that. He understands that. And the forgiveness is available if we are contrite and, and we are seeking his will and uh, trying to be obedient to him and asking for forgiveness. Uh, that forgiveness is very available. But there's a much bigger picture than sometimes I think, and I don't necessarily hear here at Gamble Street, but I hear among other believers that, well, you know, I've accepted Christ, so when I die, I'm going to heaven. And then that's it. But that's not it. That's not it. There's so much more to the Christian life than that. You know, it's like you can't wait to find out what God has next for you to do. Mm -hmm. and you don't know how it's going to happen, but all of a sudden you're filled with the joy you can't explain. Mm -hmm. The dancing that you know, I'm trying to do in private, you start dancing. It's a relationship, and that means you're to anticipate, hopefully, uh, what God is communicating with us and to us and doing with us. You want to spend time with Him because you love Him and because He loves you. Uh, it's not a matter of rules. It's not a matter of doing and all that sort of stuff, although that's a part of it. Uh, there's so much more to the Christian walk and the Christian life than we sometimes have a tendency to think. Let me go ahead and close this with prayer. Father, we are grateful for the ultimate sacrifice that Christ has made, that unrepeatable sacrifice that he entered into the heavenly sanctuary and sat down at your right hand. We are truly, literally, eternally grateful for and that we have a much better life than we did before Christ. But you're not done with us, and there's still a process that's taking place in our lives, that process of sanctification. Help us to be um, more willing to commit more ourselves to you in full obedience, following that example of Jesus Christ, not just anticipating the time that we die and go to heaven, but anticipating the times that we will rise in the morning and meet with you, times that we will gather together as the body of Christ and be with you, and also that time of preparation for an eternity with you. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Thank you, Charles. Thanks, everyone.